Uh, let's open our Bibles tonight, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. John was about 95 or 96 years old when Domitian, the emperor, started his crusade against the church. And besides really trying to wholesale slaughter the saints, he exiled many of them to places that they couldn't gather. And John was an old timer and they put him out on an old mining little island. And there in Patmos, rather than dying, God visited John. And he gave to him this final account that we call the book of Revelation. And that's exactly what it is. It is the revelation of God, and especially the revelation of God's Son glorified. All that God had promised, all that God had, had threatened to do, all of the judgments of God, and yet the rewards of the saints, and the, the, the rulership of Christ as he comes to rule and reign, the, the bringing in of a new kingdom, a new heaven, then, and a new earth, all fulfilled in this book as it's laid out before us. And so it is really the last book that fulfills all that God has promised. And it puts Jesus before us, not meek and mild, but in all of his glory, sitting on the throne, and, you know, everyone bowing their knee, certainly, to him. And John is given at this old age this vision, which must have just blown his mind. But the Lord gave to John the outline for the book in three parts in verse 19 of chapter 1. He appeared to him in glory, had just left John as if he had died. He saw Jesus high and lifted up, and we get this great description of the Lord in chapter 1. But in verse 19, the Lord said to John, I want you to write the things which you have seen, this glorified Christ. I want you to write the things that are, and in chapter 2 and 3 he does. He writes to the church, God's people. But then after the church is taken out, chapter 4, verse 1, he says to John, and now I want you to write those things which shall be hereafter. And so we are currently in the second portion. John has written what, he, what, what was there in chapter 1, what he had seen. He is now writing about the things that are, as the Lord gives to John seven letters to deliver specifically to seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, it is Jesus' only first-person written communication with the church in the sense that it came directly from him in that regard. The, the letters themselves and we've tried to repeat that for you every week, have really three purposes. Primarily, it's written to God's people. You know, to every generation, to every one of us, they all existed in the first century as well. God's heart for the church, what we should be, what we shouldn't be, what we should like, what we shouldn't like, what we should pursue, and what we shouldn't. And in each one, we've tried to look at those in, in, in a foremost personal manner. Secondly, it is applied collectively to the church at large. It, it's a description for us of the kind of things found in the church, those who call themselves people of God. And thirdly, they are a prophetic look at the church through the ages, beginning with the Ephesian church in the first century, ending with the Philadelphia church there at the end of chapter 3, and then the church of Laodicea, the kind of two branches of the church in the last days. They are a pretty good prophetic panorama of what you see in the church over the years. But first and foremost, you've got to take it to heart for you, for me. Uh, we, we've looked so far at the Ephesian church, which really is prophetically representative of the first century church. The problem for them was they were very busy, very large, very mobile, very involved. But the Lord said the, the problem that he had with the church was at, by the end of the first century, they'd left their first love. Their motivation had changed. And so we spent some time looking at that. The second church, Smyrna, prophetically represents the age of the church through about 312 A.D. when Constantine came upon the scene. The Smyrna church was the church that had borne very well under persecution. There's not a word of rebuke in the letter that the Lord sends to them, not a word of correction, just great promises. Hang in there, man. Hang in there. You know, you're going to see the Lord's work accomplished. We then looked at the letter that the Lord wrote to the church of Pergamos, which prophetically represents you know, from the time of Constantine when he allowed everything to come into the church, and everybody's now a Christian, through the 5th century, where there were very few saints in the fellowship that the Lord wrote to that really embraced the Lord. Many of them were embracing the doctrines of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, just things that God hated had crept into the church. And then last week we looked at the church of Thyatira, which represented really the, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, through the time of the Protestant Reformation, and even from the letter, it was a time of tremendous corruption, 
There were fewer saints in the church, lots of false doctrine, lots of self-appointed false prophets. And we spent quite a bit of time last week looking at that church and how it relates to us today. Tonight, we'd like to continue in our church studies through, as we get to chapter 3, and one more chapter till we get to the, you know, the rapture of the church, glorious chapter 4 and 5. But here we'd like to look tonight at the church of Sardis. Prophetically, it, it represents the time of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, which was roughly, well, 1517 A.D. to about 1750 or so. And when Luther was excommunicated, his cause was picked up by a lot of other folks, guys like Huss and Luther, or sorry, Huss and Calvin and Swingley and others. There was a move towards um, the reforming of the, of the concept that the church shouldn't have the Bible. And, and we should return to the scriptures. The, the problem with the Reformation, if you read historically, was that it left a lot of things undone because soon the church began to find its newfound freedom in the scriptures. They got what they wanted, you know, things turned their way, if you will. And rather than rejoicing in the truth, they got stuck in the mud and they began to say to themselves, hey, we're Christians, we're part of the Reformation. And they became proud of themselves and of their attachment, of their title, if you will, but there wasn't much of a passion any longer for the Lord. And even to this church tonight, the Lord will say, I know that you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. You have a reputation, but that reputation is not what I see in you today. And so there was a, a reputation without a present reality. And the Lord, in writing to Smyrna in the first century and to the church age as well, writes to a church that had the, had the right doctrines, but had no life. It was a church on life support. They had uh, you know, been given all that they needed. There was no persecution, there was no difficulty, there was no pressure, there was no resistance, there was no opposition. They had what they wanted. They could worship as they pleased. They had the scriptures as they were taught. They had the right answers. They had lost heart. And so the Smyrna church reminds us or speaks to us about the need to be careful that you have everything right. And then you have no heart anymore for the things of God. Let's read uh, the first six verses here and then we'll go over them like we have in all of the others. The destination, Jesus' description of himself as the author, any commendations from him, any rebukes or exhortations from him, and then any promises or warnings. And to the angel the Lord says, Angelos, the, the leadership, the messenger, the pastor of the church in Sardis. Right, Jesus says, these things says he, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent, and therefore if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Sardis was a... Um, a fairly wealthy large town located, if you look at a map, 50 miles or so east of Smyrna or about 30 miles south of Thyatira. And it was the capital of the, of the Lydian province. It was known for its wealth. It was known for its influence. Uh, today there is a city there called Sart. It is a very poor city. But it wasn't so in the first century. The city itself, Sardis, was located on a a 15-foot high plateau above a valley, and the people took great confidence in their position to say, you know, no one can take us out. We are untouchable. We are impregnable. We are, we are safe from attack and from hostility. And, and if you look at their situation, you'd say, well, they're in a pretty good place. However, even in history, twice they had been conquered, both in surprise attacks at night. Cyrus had come in, King Cyrus of Persia in 539 BC when the Babylonians were overthrown, and he had in one night come in and wiped out this very wealthy city. Antiochus Epiphanes, 325 years later in 214 BC, had done the exact same thing. 
the intertestament times between the Old Testament and the New. And just recently, like 80 years before this letter was written, the town had been absolutely leveled by an earthquake. So by the time of John's writing, uh, it had been recently rebuilt with the kindness of Emperor Tiberius, but it was a wealthy kind of self-assured and, and, and aloof kind of people. Historically, their, their, their main industry was woolen goods and jewelry, and uh, beyond that, we know very little of the church at Sardis. We do have a um, second century commentary on the book of Revelations from a bishop of Sardis named Melito. It's still in print. You can get it if you like. It isn't easy reading, but it's there. Uh, Jesus does not point out to this church that they were facing any difficulty at all. There's no particular trial. There's no particular person. There isn't any persecution from anyone. Um, in, in the first century, emperor worship and idolatry were rampant in every culture, but that didn't seem to be an issue here as well. Uh, the early historian Herodotus wrote of Sardis that it was just simply a morally lax place that accurately reflected the times of the Roman Empire. They were the live and let live church. They fit right in. In fact, this is a very noticeable change in the letters that Jesus has written because in this letter, um, this fifth letter, for the first time, Jesus doesn't begin by having anything good to say to them. Up to now in every church, even in the weakest of churches, the Lord begins with a positive, not so here. There really isn't anything to be found here that can be applauded. The church at, at Sardis did not have a problem with outward persecution. The church at Sardis had no problem with inward or internal doctrinal perversion. They had it, the Bible right. They were free to do as they pleased in the Lord. They didn't know the satanic depths of compromise that the Lord, you might remember, had written there in chapter 2, verse 24, to the church in Thyatira, that they had known the depths of Satan in, in this you know, compromised situation. <clears throat> None of those were their problems. This church was dying the slow and agonizing death brought on simply by apathy and indifference. I've heard it all before. I've seen it all before. I really don't want to be involved with it any longer. And their struggle to be a witness in a very dark world around them had been abandoned. The church had instead joined the community at large. This wasn't some scandalous wickedness that had destroyed a fellowship in town. This was a decent dying <laughs> where the shell was still there and the form was still there, but the heart was gone. And Jesus' words were still believed. You stand up and say, you know what the Bible says? And everyone has said, amen. It's exactly what it says. Maybe even could tell you where it said it. They just weren't attached to it anymore. It, it didn't affect their outlook. It, it didn't matter to their conduct. It, it, it didn't matter to them at all. They could hear it. It would pass through. It would leave them absolutely unchanged. And the church had become as lifeless and barren as the town itself. Terrible feeling. And Jesus in this letter warns them and us of the ever-present danger to anyone in the church, even the most faithful church, that you can go from the initial zeal and your reliance upon the word and God's power and have a good spiritual mindset and devotion and outlook and dependence and somehow end up just going through the motions. Autopilot. You know, the pulpit used to be filled with the preaching of the gospel. Now it's mentioned, and everybody nods, and we move on. But there's no more life. And many of the church, by the time that the Lord's letter arrives in Sardis, weren't believers at all. They would be left behind. The, the, the coming of the Lord would catch them unaware like a thief in the night. They wouldn't know the times in which they lived. But they were church people. They just weren't God's people. And the message from the pulpit might very well still have been right on, but, but the congregation has lost the meaning of it. It's like a terminal illness. You know, it engulfs the assembly. And, and if it continues, the church that once was known for its fiery preaching and love for God would become a relic and a reminder of the past. You can die on the vine. You can die on the vine. And Sardis is a letter to an all but dead church that Jesus seeks to fan the embers that are left back into life. 
Notice in verse 1 that the, the, the title that Jesus takes for himself out of chapter 1, it's actually found in verses 4 and 16 and 20 of, of chapter 1, is that he holds in his hands the seven spirits of God. When we talked about sevens and the spirit, we talked in chapter 1 about this being the fullness of of the Spirit of God. In other words, Jesus said, I'm writing to you and I have the fullness of God's Spirit in my hand. Not only that, I hold in my hand the seven stars. They are representative of the pastors, of the overseers, not just of the Sardis church, but of all of the churches. I'm the one who is, is able to give you the power of God's Spirit and to send you teachers and those who would bring you words from the Lord. I'm the one that you need to look to. He's the head of the church. And the Holy Spirit will enable us to submit our lives to the Lord. The church was born, and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon us, and we became children of God. But Jesus is the head. The Holy Spirit in us is like the nervous system, right? He sends orders from the head. He directs our hands and our feet and our toes. He, he moves us around. And Jesus, as he begins to write to this very dead church, says that he's the one who will give the Holy Spirit. He's got it in fullness in his life. Yet, Sardis wasn't filled with the Spirit. They weren't being led of the Lord. There, there was no life to be given. There no life to be found. His anointing wasn't upon them. His power had been set aside. His presence was hidden from view. You know, they were gathering every week, and for all you know, the church was filled. But they were powerless. They had nothing. No relationship with God. Everything proper and in its place. Everything quotable and, and properly documented. Every verse footnoted and in the right place. Not taken out of context. Just no one cares. You know the Lord loves, yeah, yeah, we read it. I can give you four verses. All you can get from the Lord, this church, is I know your works. I know that you have a reputation, a name, that you're alive, but you're not, you're dead. This is as good as it gets for a common. If you look for commendations, this is not good. I know your works. We've mentioned to you for the last five weeks now that, that we can hide the reality of our spiritual condition from a lot of people. You can fool your family. You can probably fool the role you're sitting in. You know, you can fool yourself. But you can never fool the Lord. And, and this little clause finds its way into every letter to tell us again and again, God knows what we're up to from the inside out. We sang it tonight. From the inside out, God is aware that your hands might be raised, but your heart is not. And notice from verse 1 that even if you have a good spiritual reputation, which speaks of a past tense, that really cannot hide the truth from God about your current condition or the present tense. I used to. I remember when. That's one thing. We used to. What are you doing today? And I always worry when I say to people, so what's the Lord been teaching you? And they'll say this, well, back in 1991. And you want to stop and go, well, that was 20 years ago. Can you just get it a little closer to today? You know, but they can't. They have a great reputation. They were the, the leaders of the pack. They were the first ones into the church. They had a Bible with, with every, uh, you know, verse underlined. We used to kid a guy that when we grew up in the Lord, he'd, he'd underline. And we just said, look, just underline the stuff you don't want to remember. Because he had literally underlined every verse, you know, and after a while you couldn't even see the page numbers and the words anymore. But that was then, and this is now. That was then. This is now. He says you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. I, I think it's startling to realize that there could be such a stark contrast between man's perception of the church in Sardis and God's perspective, uh, opinion, God's perspective. Jesus' spot-on opinion, you're dead. Everybody goes, man, this has been a fabulous church. You know, this thing, this was established in 1812. It's been for, you know, it's going on 200 years. And you, yeah, you're dead. Uh, look how beautiful it is. It's beautiful, <laughs> but you're dead. Well, you know, who used to preach here? Maybe so, but not now. You're dead. That God somehow looks and values the internal condition of the heart, and, and he isn't swayed by anything else. That, that, that we should know that, that God has a view of the church that oftentimes is far different than ours. We might think we're spiritual. God might think we're dead. It all takes that looking within, doesn't it? 
And the Lord writes to this church, I know that you have a reputation. God is not fooled by TV lights and crystal cathedrals and Christian theme parks. He really doesn't care. He really is interested in the heart. And success in his eyes is far different than it is in the worldly communion, community or, or sometimes even in the evangelical community. David wrote in Psalm 51 these words, Lord, you do not desire sacrifice, or I would give it to you. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a, a contrite heart. And God, you will not despise those things. That wasn't going on in this church. Now understand, if you walked into Sardis, you wouldn't hear anything amiss. You wouldn't listen and go, well, that's weird doctrine. No, no, you'd agree with everything you heard. They, they, were, they were down the middle, down the middle of the road. They weren't over to the left. They weren't weird over here to the right. They were just right, solid, square where they should be. And you go, oh, this is a good church. No. Dead church. Oh, but, you know, my great, 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 great used to go. Yeah, maybe so. Not now. Such a distinguishing mark between God's point of view and theirs. There are certainly churches today that have a name that lives, but have long since died to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The organization still stands, it just no longer bears lasting fruit. The state church in Germany, the Lutheran church, continues to experience what all of the Western European churches are experiencing, an alarming plunge in attendance. So that in Europe now, in most countries, over 50% of the people in their populations say they never go to church. 50%. And yet, the Lutheran church has a pretty good reputation that it lives. In Sweden, in Denmark, in Norway, less than 10% of the population actually attend church regularly. If you go to Europe and you look at the ministries that are there, and we know lots of folks there, a lot of Calvaries are doing pretty well in, the, in Europe, there, there is this tremendous oppressiveness of living in almost in a post-Christian society. You can travel through any major city in Western Europe and find the cathedral downtown. And I would almost guarantee you no one's using it. It's beautiful. It's been up since the 1500s. It's on the tour. The bus stops there. For two bucks you can see inside. They'll tell you who used to preach there and what used to happen there. Somebody spent their entire life putting up those fancy windows and carving those little animals at the top of the spires, you know, and you go, oh, look at this, the domo. <laughs> yeah. Where are the people? And no people. <laughs> it's not good. And it used to be a place of worship, but now it's a stop on the city tour. And what you get to hear about is better days gone by, a glorious past. In our own country, liberalism is, is, is so attached to our culture that even in, in many of the Bible schools today, uh, half of our, our Protestant seminaries in America deny the virgin birth. Half of them. 70% of the kids in seminary in America question the reality of hell. And there's a continuing debate about the authority of the scriptures, the inspiration of the scriptures. So we really believe the Bible and all that it says. And yet these are all people who claim to know the Lord. But they've departed from believing in him. They don't believe his word. Look, once the Bible ceases to be the authority for your believing, then you're in trouble. You have now set adrift on a world of opinions. And look, let me just say this to you more than anything else. God meant what he said. He said what he meant. If we can't trust what he said, we're done. If he isn't trustworthy, what hope do we have? The bishop of the church in England in Gloucester uh, several years ago got in the pulpit and said God was dead. Well, this letter from the Lord to the church of Sardis says that bishop is dead. He's missed the boat. A name that lives, a reputation for godliness, a glorious past <laughs> with no present life. It's interesting to me that even of all of the movements that we have seen in our last few generations, that, that historically the movement of God's spirit amongst the people rarely makes it three generations. 
before the people just begin to settle in and they go through the motions and they lose the heart and they lose the love of God and they lose the respect for the scriptures and, and the thing just dies and the Lord just picks up and begins again. It's a danger for us even in our own life. We get stuck in the mud and life drones on when the work of the Spirit departs. There was a study done by Duke University in 2007 called the National Congregation Study. Their, their, their interest was to interview 20 or 30,000 people across the country from different denominations and congregations to de determine who goes to church, how often do they go, how large is the church, how involved are they in the fellowship. And they put out, and I think you might even be able online to get it for free now. So it's, it's a study called National Congregation Study. Um, it's a huge uh, study. But here, here's what I gleaned from it just in the hour or so that I looked over it. The average church size in America, as of 2007, that's the latest time that they've done this, 75 people in, a, in the average church in America. 75. The largest 10% of the congregations in the country account for 51% of all of the people going to church. So most congregations are fairly small. In fact, the 75 per average church size in America has not changed since 1998. So in the last 10 years, it stayed exactly the same. Most people attend congregations of an average size of 400. 25% of every church in America is under 50 people. Only 10% have at least 1,000 folks. 2% have 2,000 adults. The 100th largest church in America has a little less than 6,000 members. So that's the entire 310 million people in the country. Can you imagine how few people are actually going to church? Now, we have a name that lives. We're a Christian nation. Your money in your pocket says, in God we trust. You have a name. But are we alive? Well, we were. And that's the Lord's word to Sardis. A church filled with reputation <laughs> and no life. A church filled with, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Methodist. We've always been Methodists. God loves the Methodists. I'm Lutheran. Whatever you are, are you in love with and walking with Jesus Christ? That's the key. Because certainly, even in the first century, a church existed that had a reputation that had already been given up upon. And we've got to be careful, you and I, careful that we don't settle in and glory in the past, but rather press on in the present. You know, I always hope that my greatest experiences in the Lord are still ahead of me. You hate to sit back in the old rocking chair and go, well, back in the Jesus days. Well, that's fine back then. It's good to remember what the Lord did, but I want to see what the Lord will do now, today, with us. Vance Havner wrote a book years ago that he said that, that unfortunately, there, there is in many ministries a four-stage process. He said a, a ministry starts with a man that God calls, who leads them by faith in God into a movement. But if they're not careful, that movement becomes a machine, like the Ephesians, and they end up a monument. Here's what used to be. Look at the, the fantastic cathedral that we have built that is now in bankruptcy or is now you know no longer attended by anyone but there was a time <laughs> when God's word was being preached there when the when the name of Jesus was being lifted up there we have to be careful that we don't become like Sardis a petrified monument We don't want to be talking about what God did all the time. We want to talk about what God is going to do. And we need to be able to stay fresh, you know. It's really easy to get tired of singing the same old songs and sitting. Many of you sit in the same old spot. If you really don't want me to know whether you're here or not, move around. Some of you, I can almost tell you, you've, you've missed your row by one, you know. <laughs> There's a lot in life that is habitual, and the danger of, of habit is it can kill relationship. 
It's true in your marriages. It's true in your friendships. Absolutely true in your walk with God. You know, we need to stay close to him in a living way. His word is as alive as it's ever been. And God will do greater things if we'll just look to him. And we can't lose sight of that. You know, God help us to stay fresh because a good reputation is no guarantee of a present tense internal spiritual condition that pleases the Lord. Sardis was a well-respected place. Yet God thought of them this way. And I would say to you, what he thinks is much more important than what anybody else thinks. So Jesus holds out hope to those in Sardis, and he offers counsel that would turn things around. And he says there in verse 2 and in verse 3, beginning with the words, be watchful. And it's literally the word for wake up. It's in, in Greek in the present imperative participle. So it's a present tense imperative participle, which literally means wake up and stay awake. Hey, wake up, stay awake. Hey, wake up, stay awake. It's the tense. It's repetitive. It's meant to just say, wake up. What, what was the problem with those in Sardis? They were extremely unconcerned about their spiritual well-being. They were snoozing. They were indifferent. They wandered through life without ever taking God's word and applying it to their situation. Be careful that we don't become those kind of people who just don't apply the word of God. Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 13, look. This is high time that we awake out of our sleeps. Our salvation is now nearer than, than when we first believed. The Lord's coming, man. we got to be ready. Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 5, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. Christ will give you light. Walk circumspectly. Don't be fools. Be wise. Redeem the time. The days are evil. And Jesus goes through his great time of torment in the Garden of Gethsemane as he, as he realizes the time has come for him to be separated from the Father, so we'll never have to be. He wasn't afraid of the pain. <laughs> he was afraid of the separation. If, Father, if there's any other way, let's do it another way. And the angel of the Lord came to minister to him, and Jesus said, Father, not my will, yours be done. But then he turned around and found all of these disciples who had so vowed to be with him, Peter included, snoring hour after hour. Can't, couldn't you just stay awake with me for one hour? Couldn't you pray with me for one hour? <sighs> Lord, we love you. But you see I'm sweating great drops of blood? No, we love you, but we're tired. Wake up. So easy to begin to stumble into that sleepiness that can just take away from us the life God has for us. Watch, therefore, the Lord said. You don't know when the master of the house is coming. Maybe in the evening, maybe at midnight, maybe at the crowing of the rooster in the morning. But look, I'll say this to you, just watch. Sardis had become very unconcerned. They followed their habits in their spiritual life without a relationship with God. They had to reach back to reminisce. They had nothing in the present tense from which to share. You remember that, that parable that Jesus told um, of the wise and the foolish versions there in, in Matthew 25. And he said, the kingdom of heaven was like these who ten virgins and five were uh, wise and five were foolish. And they who were foolish took lamps but no oil. The wise one took oil in the vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. But at midnight, it was, a cry came out, Behold, the bridegroom's coming. Go to meet him. And the, the virgins arose to trim their lamps. But the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps have gone out. And the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go for yourself and to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went into with him into the wedding. And the door was shut. And afterwards, those other virgins came, saying, Lord, open to us. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. And then the Lord said this, watch therefore, you don't know whether the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. In the context of waiting and being ready for Jesus, the Lord gives us a parable there in Matthew 25 that kind of lines up with many of those that you find in Matthew 13, where the, 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 the types used in the parables are defined for us so that we don't change them as we go. And you get to Matthew 25 right after the, the Lord had spoken about the Olivet Discourse, about his coming. And the lesson of the parable is, is you've got to be ready. And Jesus gives it to his disciples in the context of warning that since we don't know when he's coming, the best thing we can do is be ready every step of the way. Or stay awake. Stay alert. You know, keep your eye 
on the heavens, if you will. And as you read, even in verse 10 of Matthew 25, you read that the ready went in and the unready did not. And the punchline is, so be ready, right? Verse 13, so be ready. The ten virgins, or the ten maidens, if you will, they had a lot of things in common. They, they all had gone out to meet the bridegroom. They all had lamps. They all fell asleep. They all had to wait for his return longer than they anticipated. They were all suddenly aroused by the word, the Lord's coming. But then those who had the oil were ready. The oil, the representation of the Holy Spirit within. Those who had a relationship with God, oh, they weren't always ready. <laughs> but when the call came, they were ready. They had some differences. The five virgins were foolish, taking no oil. The five wise virgins were ready. They, they went to trim their wicks, and, and yet the door was shut. It was too late. The foolish were left out, and they were told, the Lord said, we don't, I don't know who you are. And so Jesus says, you be ready. How vital we heed the warning that, that we be ready. And the Lord says to the, the church at Sardis, wake up. Wake up. <laughs> wake up. Now, you would think that these words would have special meaning to those living in a city that was supposed to be invincible, that had been overthrown twice, and then knocked down in an earthquake. Wake up, man. You are not invincible. You're not sitting on top of the world, you know. Shake yourself out of the death march, because inattentiveness to your spiritual well-being plays a major role in sleeping. Right? We just start to take it for granted. Well, you going to church? I might. Reading your Bible? I don't know. I got the American Idol on tape. I'd really like to see that. I might get to that Bible later. I'm a Christian, you know. I know stuff. I went forward at a harvest crusade, so you know I'm saved. Really? Wake up. Secondly, he says, strengthen the things that remain, but they are ready to die. Not only were they unconcerned about their spiritual condition, they were unaware of the seriousness and of the danger of their present condition. Look, a church doesn't die in a day. Your spiritual life doesn't fall apart in the day. If you're in backslidden state, you worked real hard to get there. Those are small steps away from God until you're miles away. It doesn't happen overnight. You, you start to develop a habit that doesn't fan the flames. This church was on life support. Some of them wouldn't make it through the night. The prognosis was very poor. And the Lord said, look, just throw yourself in to strengthening those things that remain. He said that to the pastors. Strengthen those that are still there. You know, there are plenty of churches in America that, that have been around for 25 years that have 30 people in attendance. Now, that's fine if you're in a small town. But if you have 30 people in your church and the town has 1.2 million people, there's something wrong. There's something wrong, and it doesn't speak well of the work within. If there isn't outreach, if there isn't a love for the loss, if you're not ministering to the king, kids, if there isn't any vision, if there's stagnance, you know, in, in your life, there, wake up. There's still a few hungry. There's still a few open. There's still a few longing to be fed. And it's interesting to me. Sometimes we'll have folks blow in here, and, and they'll say, well, we came from such and such a church. I said, why did you come? They'll say, I'm not getting fed. I'm not learning anything. Now, they don't teach the Bible over there. Really? What is church all about if you don't have a Bible? It can't all be about raffles, can it? <laughs> so sad. The Lord goes on, he said, I haven't found your works to be perfect before God. They were unconcerned about their spiritual state. They were unaware of how serious these things were. And they were unresponsive to the Lord. I haven't found your works to be perfect. Jesus does not specify what was lacking in their work. But they must have, have clearly known that they weren't measuring up. So Sardis was not available any longer. I need some servants, the Lord cries out, and Sardis is very apathetic, you know. There was a fire there that was once burning. They have a picture of the guy who really led them one day in the foyer and a little book about his life. But the fire was going out. And so Jesus, in verse 3, gives them three things to ride a sinking ship. Number one, he says, remember how you have received and heard. I love it. You know, every church starts at a time of revival on some scale. Every person gets saved at a time when the Lord is moving and you're listening. No one came to the Lord in a very down time in the sense that when God began to move, you just go, I don't even remember that. No, 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 you remember. 
You know, you were brokenhearted. You, you were at, the, at wit's end. You had nowhere to turn and no one to look to. And, and Jesus came and made himself known to you. Your lives were falling apart. Your marriage wasn't doing well. You had a drug problem. You, you, you had a gambling problem. You just had problems. And Jesus came in and revival took place. And the Lord said to these folks in Sardis, remember how you got here. Remember what brought you here. When the Holy Spirit was moving on your heart, when you had vision and purpose and commitment, when you loved God's word and you trusted the Lord and you, you were interested in sharing your faith, when, when outreach was all about something you wanted to be involved in. Remember how it used to be. How you began to grow, how great it was. I remember when I got saved uh, in 1973, we would drive out to Pastor Chuck's church from Bellflower four days a week and just sit and listen to Pastor Chuck teach. Oh. And Sunday nights he went through the Bible like we do, but he would go like two and a half hours, like we don't. And, and well, I can't do it. And he could do it. But anyway, he, and, and after two and a half hours, you know, he'd do like 10 or 20 chapters, and we go, oh, and he'd go, let's pray. And we'd do this, no. Come on, one more chapter. So excited. We didn't want to be anywhere else. Wouldn't have missed it for the world. Didn't care what else was going on. I'm gonna, Sunday night, I was there, 7 o'clock, man. Come on, Chuck. Had underliners and yellow markers and, and, and stickers because and, I didn't know my Bible, so I'd have to sticker where it, I'd find that later. I'd hang stuff out, you know, those little deals on the end. My, I'd come home with junk all out. Oh, perfect. Can't wait for Tuesday night. Can't wait for Thursday night. Can't wait to go back to the concerts on Saturday night. Can't wait to invite the guy from work, the guy from school, the guy in the neighborhood. Well, they'll probably say, I know, but I'm asking them anyway because they got to get saved. Those are good days. You remember those days? What happened to you? Because I still feel the same way. <laughs> How easily we can just settle in. We start to have a ritual and familiar practices and traditions and we become complacent. We start to say, yeah, we have baptisms a couple of times a year. Yeah, we do communion every month. I don't know. I think it was last week. I don't remember. Yeah, oh, it's Easter again. We'll probably be outside. I hope it's not so cold as last year. Oh, last year was just ridiculous. The rain in that second service. Oh, I thought the pastor was never going to quit. I can't believe he was talking in the rain. Would he just stop for five minutes? Yeah, yeah. have you been going to the retreats? Well, I used to go to the retreats, but they're boring. You know, i got to sleep in that bed I'm not really comfortable with. And, you know, my back's a little like that. The food isn't exactly great. It's okay, but it's not really great. And then my buddy's not going this year, so I don't think I'll be going this year. I love Jesus. Look, you can't have the been there, done that attitude when it comes to your faith. Been there, want to do it again, maybe. <clears throat> because it is still as exciting as ever. Remember how it once was. That's what the Lord says. <clears throat> and it sounds a bit like the advice that the Lord gave in chapter 2 to the Ephesians. You remember when you got saved? You remember who shared with you? You remember how you felt the first night you went to bed after you got saved? You remember who you told, who you didn't tell? You remember who you wanted to tell? Remember all the promises you made to God? Oh, God, from now on, I tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm so saved. <laughs> but I tell you what, all of that was going on when you were walking with God and hungry to know him and foolish enough to believe him. That can die. And you can still have all the right... Bible studies, and you can have all the right verses, and you can sit next to all the right people and walk out absolutely dead. And the church can go that way. Several years ago, the keynote speaker at a major denomination here in America began their yearly convention, and he did it with tongue-in-cheek to 40,000 delegates, and this is what he said. We have gathered here this week to devise methods by which the Holy Spirit of God may be regulated and made more efficient. Now, he didn't mean that. But he did it as a kind of a tongue-in-cheek to say, look, what are we doing having a meeting about how we're going to run the church? Let's let the Lord run the church. Let's let the Holy Spirit move. We should just really gather together and ask the Lord to guide us. I recall the days of um, when our church started. We, we met at a school just over here on Santa Gertrudis, and, and people used it during the week, and they trashed it, and they knew the church was coming, so they didn't clean it. Bathrooms were filthy, the floors were dirty, there was no air conditioning, the, there was little league in the field in the back. We got to use three classrooms that were always filled with like Halloween pictures and whatever. And we just said, you know, wow, we'll no one will ever come here. And the church grew like crazy. 
years ago and we tried to rebuild this facility because it was very small and we had to put in more classrooms. The fire department let us put up a tent on the uh, lawn next to, right next to the, to the uh, classroom wing and, and the chief of the uh, fire department came and goes, yeah, those are supposed to be so many feet away and yeah, that's not going to be too good. And I went, oh, great. And then he goes, but you know the Lord's good. You just be careful. And he signed it off. <laughs> oh. How you doing, buddy? Very cool. And, and we thought again, who's going to come to something like this? You know, it's in the grass. It's hot. We were out there all summer. Um, I have like all these grass out. I was just sneezing like crazy. It was, I hated it. And, and we doubled in size. There's, there's a way that the Holy Spirit moves. God can be honored. And then there's a way to regulate just everything and forget about who we're serving. We can't forget where we came from. Remember, the Lord says, remember. I remember the no air conditioning and sitting on the grass. Remember that. Oh, Lord, you can do anything. You're awesome. Church grows in the worst of conditions and in perfect conditions it dies. Why is that? Remember where you came from, how you have received and how you have heard. What a great bit of advice the Lord gives us to, to, to not stagnate. Second of all, he tells us to reestablish our commitment to him. How you have received and heard, now hold fast and, and, and repent. The word hold fast is the same word keep that you read there in verse 8 and in verse 10 of um, Chapter 3, a little bit further on to the Philadelphia church, he uses the word keep. I will keep you. You've been kept. And, and that's the word for uh, hold fast here. Jesus tells the, the church in Sardis to come back to full compliance. If you don't want to die spiritually, then run to the Lord and hang on. And hang on. Notice that a deficiency of God's word and obedience to it can leave you dead. So go back to how you've received and heard when you came in faith believing and hungry and excited and dependent and consistent, great reverence, you were very teachable, willing to, to put in the effort, and then come back to that. Reestablish your relationship with God again. And then repent, he says. Change your direction. Radical steps are necessary to get freed from the doldrums. I'm, I'm sure that people sometimes come in and they say this, I don't feel like it anymore. You know, where did my feeling go? I used to feel so saved, and I'm still not sure what that feels like, feel saved, but you either are or you're not. Uh, but I've lost my feeling, and, and, and how can I get it back? And, and, and what I said was, well, what were you doing when you had it? Oh, and they'll tell you a hundred things. Are you still doing those? No. Well, no. next. <laughs> How we need to teach the Bible, not some latest fad. How we need to read the Bible, not some latest foolish book. What are you going to do on day 41 after your 40 days of purpose? You're still going to need God's word. You're still going to need his spirit. You're still going to need to know him. Just no way around it. You'll, you'll die. We, we have to teach the Bible without gimmicks or sales pitches. We don't have to add to it. Whatever God has said is enough for our life. We don't need big names in the pulpit. We don't need a big show. We need the Holy Spirit to move. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Look, I came to you in my speech and my preaching. We're not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and His power. That's how we live. That's what we long for. And if you don't wake up, then we suffer the consequences. And you find yourself and will find a generation of people sitting in churches that once taught the word of God that are now filled with people that don't know the Lord at all. Sitting in a church that has a reputation to be alive but is now dead. And our Lord's extremely patient. But the judgment of God eventually falls. It eventually comes. So we read here, therefore, if you will not watch, verse 3, I will come upon you as a thief. You'll not know the hour that I come. In other words, the suddenness of the rapture and will catch the religious man by surprise. Yet the true church isn't surprised. Isn't that what we're told throughout the Bible? You be ready. You be ready. You're not in darkness that that day should overtake you like a thief. I think Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in chapter 5. You're ready. 
Church is looking up. We're ready. We're not going to be fooled. But those that are sitting in churches that were once alive but are now dead are going to be caught by surprise, overwhelmed. And here the phrase is applied to the spiritually dead in Sardis. Their judgment will come suddenly without further announcement. And yet, the Lord said, even in that church of such little life, there were a few who had not defiled their garments, were walking with the Lord in white, were worthy, actually had been made worthy. In, in this dead church were still some people who had vibrant faith, who loved the Lord, proud of their cleansing, wearing their white robe, made worthy by the Lord, practicing what they preached, walking and talking the word of God. It, it, it blesses me to know that even in the worst of places, God can still find his own. Folks that may be in churches that aren't teaching much and aren't growing much and nothing much is going on, but there's some hearts that are just hungry. And the Lord knows who they are. And notice he points them out. There's, a, 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 there's an ember burning. There's a remnant. There's a, the word sardis, by the way, means remnant or escaping few. There were some coming out. And the Lord says in verse 5 to them, if you are the overcomer, that's the saint in every letter, the one overcoming by their faith. What did John write in 1 John? What, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, your faith. Who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So here's the overcomer, the, the few that are in white, the overcomers. What do they get? Well, the Lord gives them some promises, perfection. They're going to be clothed in white garments. I'm going to like being in heaven clean, aren't you? You, you find this verse, by the way, or this, this little phrase, white garments, a lot. You find it of the saints in chapter 4, verse 4, of the martyred saints in chapter 6, verse 11, of those whose robes have been dipped in the blood in chapter 7, verse 11, the saints of God clothed in Christ. Perfection. Second of all, you get security. He says, I will not blot your name out of the book of life, which tells me a couple of things. Number one, I suspect everyone's name was in the book of life at one time because the will of God is that no one would perish. And yet, many folks reject God's call, and so their names are taken out. But once I give my life to Christ, once I follow him, I suspect that my name is written in indelible ink by the blood of the Lamb. I'm secure. I will not blot your name out of the book of life. Oh, Praise the Lord. And thirdly, there's going to be acceptance. I will confess your name before my Father and his angels. What did Jesus say there in Matthew chapter 10? Whoever confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father. Who has never, whoever will not, then I will not. And what does it say in Romans 10? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So I get to heaven white garment, my name in the book of life, acceptable to the Father as Jesus stands up for me in heaven. So the few, they make it. This is a, a complete church, and there's only a few who make it because the church wasn't persecuted to death, wasn't threatened, didn't chew on a lot of bad doctrine. They just got apathetic. They died with food all around them. They just didn't eat. <laughs> They didn't remember, they didn't repent, they didn't return. You gotta ask yourself, are you playing church or are you walking with God? Are you as zealous as you've ever been or are you stuck in the mud? You're here, but you got nothing else to do. If you've lost your enthusiasm for Jesus, if there isn't a hunger for the word, if there isn't, if there isn't a drive in you to get your Bible out and get on your knees, then go to verse 2 and go to verse 3 in, in particular and, and listen to what the Lord says so that you might be restored. Because verse 6 says, we have to have an ear to what the Spirit is saying to us. Next week, we get to look at a good letter. So read ahead. The Church of Philadelphia, I think, goes through verse 13. And uh, we'll talk about that next week. Father, how blessed we are tonight as we sit together that you're our Lord and that there isn't really any reason why the church shouldn't continue generation after generation except that there's a real danger for us to grow very apathetic. We recognize even from your word that persecution can sometimes keep us strong because 
it forces us to practice what we know, to maintain our spiritual diligence. But we live in a country that just about lets us do whatever we want spiritually. There's really not much pressure to, to go to church. There's certainly not much pressure to stay out of church. We live in an affluent society. We don't have the kind of problems that many people in the world face, at least not to their degree. And so we find ourselves quoting Bible verses, but not really having to hang on to them. We pray over our food, but we believe that it's good. Were we in a, in a tribal country, in some third world place, where the food seemed to be less than sanitary, we might really take to heart asking you to bless our food. But here we just pray quickly so we can eat. And Lord, that we wouldn't settle in. That we wouldn't grow cold. That we wouldn't be apathetic. That somehow the love that we once experienced for you wouldn't, wouldn't now somehow have escaped us. Your love for us certainly is the same. Your promise is as, as good as ever. Your spirit more than willing and able to work in us. Your plans for us greater than we could ever imagine. Our future glorious. Heaven phenomenal. The lost in every place we go were the ones, Jesus, you died for. And now say to the church, go to every creature and preach the gospel to each one of them. Lord, may you stir us up. May we as a church and as a body, of a, a, a group of believers in you, never sit back and just let things go by. May we be more excited than ever to serve you, to love you, to follow you. Maybe tonight you're not a Christian. You, you're in church a lot, but you have never really given Jesus your life, and there's really not a hunger in your heart for him. Pastors will be up front after the service. Would you come and talk to one of the guys and just say, look, I'm really dry. I really need to know, again, to return to those things that once filled my heart. I know that the Lord will refresh you, that those times of refreshing from the Lord will come. And that Jesus sent this letter to this church to remind all of us that it's really easy to have a name that lives and then to just to coast. But not to remember that relationships require time and, 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 and they require an investment of our life. We, we need to come to you often, believe you more than we do, and love you with all that we have. If you're, if, you're, if you're in that place of feeling dead tonight spiritually, would you come and let the, the Lord just minister to you? And let us pray with you that God might restore and revive and pour out upon you His Spirit so that the joy of the Lord will be your strength again. And your life in serving Him will never have been sweeter. He's willing. He's waiting. He's wanting that.